Well, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good early morning. Good afternoon. I know you're coming in from all over the world. A welcome to climate change in California. What we know, what we don't know, and what it all means for the Golden State with Drs. Daniel uh, Swain and Noah Diffenbaugh. I'm Janine Olson. I'm co-chair of the Stanford Alumni for Climate Action Group. As an Oregonian, I would like to thank California for the weather buoys off Crescent City that give us an inkling of what is heading our way. This Earth Month event is brought to you by Stanford Alumni for Climate Action, and we are a nonpartisan science-based subgroup of Stanford Alumni in Sustainability who are deeply concerned about the devastating effects of climate change. Our mission is to educate and inspire action, small and large, individual and collective, to meet the climate crisis. Today's presentation will last about 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session and closing uh, likely right around 6 p.m. Pacific. Please do not put your questions in the chat. Instead, use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and be sure to upvote questions you like. This event is being recorded and will be available in a week or two to everyone who has registered. Now, if you find the chat distracting, you can click the caret button next to the chat box and unclick the show previews button. You can also enable closed captioning at the bottom of the screen. So now with the housekeeping done, our introductions. Dr. Daniel Swain is a climate scientist focused on the dynamics and impacts of extreme events, including droughts, floods, storms, and wildfires on a warming planet. Daniel holds joint appointments as a research scientist within UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, a research fellow in the Capacity Center for Climate and Weather Extremes at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and as the California Climate Fellow at the Nature Conservancy. He engages extensively with journalists and other partners serving as a climate and weather science liaison to print, radio, television, and web media outlets to facilitate broadly accessible and accurate coverage surrounding climate change and the broader Earth system. Daniel is an alumnus of the University of California, Davis, and of Stanford University, and he completed his postdoctoral work at UCLA. He also authors the Weather West blog, which provides real-time perspectives on California and Western North American weather and climate, and can be found on both Twitter and YouTube. And now for our moderator. Dr. Noen Diffenbaugh is the Kara J. Foundation Professor and Kimmelman Family Senior Fellow in Stanford's Door School of Sustainability and the Olivier Nomalini Family University Fellow in Undergraduate Education. He was an undergrad at Stanford with a BS and MS in Earth Systems in 1997, and he did his PhD at UC Santa Cruz in 2023. So please welcome our esteemed speakers. Now over to you, Dr. Diffenbaugh. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I uh, am pleased to be here to uh, get to, um, share uh, the Zoom with Daniel, and I know uh, we're all here to hear, hear Daniel's presentation and ask questions, so I'll be brief. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, how fortunate I feel to be able to, um, been able to both, uh, you know, be Daniel's PhD advisor here at Stanford and then to get to be a collaborator uh, for all these years. And just, I want to share three things that happened this week, uh, give you a sense. Um, Daniel submitted a, a paper uh, today that I uh, am lucky to be a co-author on, so we're still working together. I'm also teaching a new class this quarter called Climate Change and Extreme Weather, and today I was giving the overview um, of sort of scientific research in that area, and I, I showed, I believe, four uh, of Daniel's papers, um, and then we had a survey in class uh, of what um, topics uh, the students would like to see covered, and I'm not making this up. The first response to the survey, uh, the the topic uh, requested was anything by Daniel Swain. So, uh, you know, Daniel is having a, a huge impact in the scientific community, having a huge impact on the public, and still having a huge impact here at Stanford. So, 
Uh, with that, Daniel, it's great to be here and I'll turn it over to you. Well, th thanks for that, Noah. I actually only knew about one of those three fun facts until <laughs> hearing them live uh, in this very conversation. So thanks. Thanks for filling me in the other two. Uh, but, you know, as I, I, I would say something that's almost the reciprocal and inverse of what Noah said, which is that it was really it's been really great working with Noah. Uh, it was as a Ph.D. student. And uh, now that I'm well past being a Ph.D. student, we are still working together, uh, which I think, as Noah might say, probably says something about the nature of the the, the professional and the personal relationship there. So it's I, I always bug Noah when there's an on-campus event. Uh, to potentially uh, work with me or introduce me, and it's uh, and uh, so so I'm glad he's able to make it. Um, it's always fun to see him on screen as well. So uh, in person, always better, but I'll, I'll take on screen. Um, so with that, I will start uh, with the presentation since I want to be able to get through it with enough time to uh, to actually open it up to questions. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of time. And I might zoom through the last bit so that to make sure there is actually time for questions, since I'm sure that there will be some, uh, per perhaps more than there is time to get through. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. You're going to see my desktop momentarily, and then you're going to see the slides that I actually want you to see. Hopefully, this should be full screen. I'll assume that it's showing up as it should be, unless somebody tells me otherwise. Looks great to me. Perfect. So as mentioned today, I want to talk about climate change in California, uh, and that includes some things that we do know, some things that we kind of know, and some things that we're a little bit more uncertain about, focusing more on the things that we do know rather than the uncertainties, uh, and sort of trying to think of holistically about what all of this means in a broader context, since I think increasingly something that I find is that the climate that we are headed for in a warming world in California is maybe a bit different than a lot of folks uh, may have assumed from the last decade that we've experienced. Um, in some ways, it's very indicative of where we're headed, and in other ways, it might be a little bit misleading. So I'll talk all about that this evening. So just a quick primer on, on California climate. Uh, this animation on the left is, in fact, something I made back when I was a PhD student at Stanford. It still holds. Uh, showing the seasonal cycle of precipitation in California. And for anybody who spent at least a few years in uh, Central or Northern California, as I assume everybody uh, in this particular uh, audience has at least a few years, uh, California actually has what is a fairly unusual uh, seasonal cycle of precipitation where it's dry in the summer and wet in the winter. And folks who are lifelong Californians sometimes say, that's not weird, that's, that's exactly how it always is. And that's true in California and in several other so-called Mediterranean climate regions globally, but it's actually kind of unusual in a global context. Often there is more of a warm season flavor to precipitation or a more even distribution uh, between uh, precipitation and the different seasons. So it is actually somewhat globally unusual to see wet winters and dry summers. Uh, and California is also unusual in the degree of year-to-year -year variability in precipitation that it experiences. So in, in the context of the United States, there truly is no place like California from the perspective of how variable precipitation is from year to year. California sees a lot of dry years, but it also sees, as we've seen recently, a lot of wet years. And the swings between these two are also greater in California than essentially anywhere else in the continental US. And it's in a top tier globally as well. Why is this from a physical perspective? One of the primary reasons is that California exists at the periphery, uh, uh, really in a climatic boundary region between uh, the more stable subtropics to the south of California and a much more mid-latitude type regime, temperate climate, if you will, to the north. But the thing is, this boundary is not static in time or space. It shifts seasonally. So that boundary is further to the north in summer when California sees its dry season. So arguably, arguably California essentially has a stable subtropical climate in the warm season. But then that boundary shifts southward in winter right along with this seasonal cycle and precipitation that you can see in the animation on the left, meaning that that boundary, California has, uh, for the most part, a more temperate climate in winter, which is why uh, it's so reliably dry during the warm months and 
in many in most most years quite reliably damp in the wet months. But not only does this shift season to season, but it also shifts from year to year. And in a year like this past winter, where we have a fairly strong El Nino event in place, for example, we see that this temperate climate boundary actually shifts locally southward in winter. So we see a, a wetter influence, a more active winter pattern than we would normally in some years versus others. And so we have this variability from season to season. It's sort of baked into what we're used to. But we also have it from year to year, and that tends to be even more variable and a little bit more random. We bounce around more with those years that are very dominated by the dry subtropical pattern or other years that are more dominated by the active temperate or mid-latitude climate, uh, more characteristic of the Pacific Northwest. And so all of that means that we have uniquely high year-to-year -year variability, but also quite high susceptibility to droughts and floods, because it really all comes down to, at least from the precipitation perspective, whatever falls during the core uh, rainy season months, primarily during the winter, is just about all she wrote uh, in any given year. So if it's a wet year, it's wet because it was wet in the winter. And if it's a dry year, it's dry because it was dry in the winter. Now, temperature comes in and plays an important role in terms of evaporation, but if we're just looking at the precipitation side of things for a moment, uh, the winter pretty much is the name of the game. Uh, and to that point, uh, I'll cut to the chase because what I've been hearing recently is a notion uh, that California is likely to get perpetually drier with less and less precipitation everywhere all the time. And although there is some truth toward California getting drier, uh, the, the nuance is actually uh, quite complicated here, because the reality is that we actually expect there to be, despite the fact that we don't actually have a very good sense of just how much California's average annual precipitation might increase or decrease or not change very much at all, there's an expectation that we will see much wider swings between very wet years and very dry years, and also between very wet individual seasons and very dry seasons. And even within that, increased variability, increased swings between wet and dry within individual winters. And I certainly think we've been seeing some early hints of that in recent years, as I'll get into in a little bit. But we, from a precipitation perspective, again, we also expect to see in a warming climate a shift towards an even sharper seasonality than we already have. So California, of course, already has uh, generally wet winters and dry summers with transition seasons in the autumn and spring. Some years they're drier than others, other years they're fairly wet. But the best available evidence right now suggests that winters might get consistently a little bit wetter on average uh, in the winter, but that the shoulder seasons, the autumn and spring, for example, might get even drier than they've been, which would result in an even shorter and sharper rainy season than we've been used to historically. Uh, there's some evidence this is already beginning to happen, particularly in the autumn, which is especially consequential uh, from a wildfire risk perspective, of course, because California's fire season usually peaks in late summer to early autumn in most places, and it pretty much lasts until the first major wetting rains arrive. So if we start to see drier autumns that increasingly overlap with offshore wind season. So if you're in Southern California, those would be the Santa Ana winds, or if you're in Northern California, it's a bit of a, a, a grab bag of different names, but you might call them the Diablo winds or the East wind or the Jarbo gap winds, uh, depending on where you are. But the increased overlap between drying in the shoulder season in autumn and those offshore winds uh, may play a role in why California has seen and will continue to see an escalation in some of these extreme wildfire seasons. So why do we care about precipitation whiplash? Sometimes it's sometimes this requires some motivation, although again, I suspect this is a bit of a self-selecting audience, but just for the sake of really driving this point home, just two examples from the Central Coast. If we look at Ventura and Santa Barbara counties back in late 2017 and early 2018, where at the time, this statistic has now been surpassed multiple times over, but the Thomas fire in December uh, became the largest fire in, in modern state history, uh, a very destructive fire as well, and was immediately followed by one of the worst debris flow events and flash flood events that, that actually killed a significant number of people near Montecito in Santa Barbara County less than a month later when a very localized heavy rain event occurred. 
But if you look at the climatological average, so if you just look at the arithmetic mean or the average of the weather during this period, uh, you might get an answer that it was mostly sunny and breezy with below average precipitations, which of course it doesn't really characterize uh, any of these very high impact events that occurred during this period. So just illustrating the broader point that I'd like to make here, which is that if we only consider changes in the average climate, then in a lot of cases, we're really going to miss the point, as is illustrated here. And there's any number of other examples. These, these are more from Northern California. All of these images, by the way, are images taken not quite from the same perspective, but of the same subject either Lake Oroville or the Oroville Dam beneath it over multiple years. And I have actually have had a version of this slide since uh, before I defended my dissertation at Stanford in 2016. And I just continue to add panels to it over the past decade as the sequence of alternating wet and dry extremes has become really conspicuous. This is up in Oroville County, and this is this is one of California's largest reservoirs, uh, very important from a water supply perspective, but also a, a sort of iconic visually. And we've swung back and forth between record low reservoir levels during historically severe droughts to some of one of the most intense atmospheric river storm sequences on record, which contributed to the near catastrophic events uh, at Oroville Dam, as you can see in the middle image. And then back to another historically severe drought before what was then uh, just last year, historically wet winter. Uh, this year feels mercifully average by comparison in many respects, but we've seen a lot of extremes even in the very same place in the very same decade. And although this is of course just one example and anecdotal, it certainly fits the mold and is illustrative of the kind of changes we expect to uh, become even more pronounced in a warming climate. So I want to dig into a little bit more about why that is. And just to zoom out briefly, this is a slightly old figure at this point, and in, in, in the climate science world, 2017 is starting to feel like a long time ago now. Uh, but the, the, the important piece is that the basics of this actually haven't changed much in the meantime. In a warming climate, we expect to see an increase in the global average precipitation of about 2 to 3 percent per degree centigrade of warming. Not a huge number, but a notable one nonetheless. But if you look at the map of the spatial pattern of mean precipitation change in a warmer climate, which is on the left, you see that there's actually quite a bit of difference from place to place. There are actually some places where average precipitation is significantly decreasing in a warming climate, and some places where it increases by a lot more than 2 to 3% per degree centigrade. Uh, you can also, though, look at the map on the right and without being too specific about the details, the point I really want to make is that there's a lot more blue and green on the map on the right showing changes in extreme precipitation per degree centigrade of warming than there is on the left map showing the average changes in precipitation. What this means is that we expect to see, for reasons that I'll describe in a moment, much more consistent increases in extreme precipitation than in average precipitation almost everywhere on Earth. And if you look at that map on the right, you can see the only regions where this really isn't true are remote subtropical ocean regions where relatively few people on Earth actually live. So over almost all populated land areas on Earth, we expect there to be a quite substantial increase in extreme precipitation events with warming. And that includes places uh, like California, if you zoom in on this map and parts of the Western US, where there's not really a clear trend toward increasing or decreasing precipitation on average, just driving home that point from earlier, but there is a strong and robust expectation that the most extreme precipitation events will intensify considerably, even in the context of a place where we're kind of throwing our hands up in the air and saying, you know, I honestly can't tell you if the average precipitation might increase a bit or decrease a bit but I can sure tell you that we're highly confident that the wettest events are going to be wetter. And on the other side of things, and this is a newer slide because I've found the need to really drive home this point about evaporation, thinking about the water cycle and the hydrologic cycle more holistically, of course, evaporation is water falling down uh, and evaporation is water uh, re-entering uh, the atmosphere uh, moving upward from bodies of water or from water that's in plants or in the soil column. And one thing I want to illustrate here, 
And there's some technical information on this slide that's not too important to think about the details. But what I really want to illustrate is that we actually expect there to be a difference between changes in relative humidity over land, where it's likely to decrease in most places with warming, and over the oceans, where relative humidity might stay relatively constant or increase a little bit. On average, globally, relative humidity might not change very much at all. In fact, the change might be pretty close to zero if you aggregate over the whole world. But this is just another illustration that it's really important to think about the specifics, because of course, most of us live on land. Not all of us, but most of us. And so it's actually quite important to understand this pattern in changing humidity over land. So on top of that, there's also something called the vapor pressure deficit, which is really a, a, a quantitative measure of how thirsty the atmosphere is, if you will. It's propensity to want to evaporate water if water is available. The higher the vapor pressure deficit, or the VPD, the greater propensity there is for the atmosphere to want to suck that water, essentially, out of the soil, out of bodies of water, and out of plants. And we know that even if relative humidity didn't change, even in a world where none of that was occurring, the vapor pressure deficit would increase rapidly with rising temperatures. So we have a decrease in relative humidity over land, and we have a thirsty atmosphere that's becoming even thirstier with warming. So we're seeing changes in evaporation, or at least potential evaporation, when there's water available to evaporate. The reason why I'm getting technical is so I can actually give you this nice visual analogy. Uh, and this is actually something that we've officially, uh, hopefully we'll be able to publish in this paper that Noah just mentioned that we submitted earlier today, which is something that I I'm, I'm calling the expanding atmospheric sponge effect. Uh, and this is supposed to evoke uh, kind of a funny as seen on TV type ad for a kitchen sponge and then a comically oversized kitchen sponge. Uh, and this is something I actually have now illustrated on camera with a comically oversized kitchen sponge. Um, I, I, I don't know where the camera crew got the really big one, the ordinary kitchen sponge. Uh, probably easy to find. But anyway, this analogy works well enough that you can actually recreate it with real sponges in your kitchen if you can find the oversized one. Because the essence of this is essentially that as the atmosphere warms, the capacity of the atmosphere to hold water vapor increases exponentially for a linear increase in temperature. In other words, it's a compounding effect. So there's a larger increase in the, the increment by which the atmosphere can hold water vapor with each additional degree of warming. And the same is then also true with the atmosphere's capacity to both uh, hold water vapor uh, and evaporate water vapor, but also for the ceiling on how intense precipitation can become. So imagine a kitchen sponge uh, that's uh, ordinary and then a kitchen sponge that's a bit uh, oversized. That larger sponge is not only going to be able to absorb more water if you spill a glass of water on the kitchen counter or something, uh, but it's also going to yield more water if you wring it out and it's saturated. So that would be the analogy for evaporation, soaking up the water, and precipitation wringing out the sponge, for example. Now, the analogy also works because none of this is true unless there's actually water on the counter. So you can't wring out a dry sponge just as a, 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 a warmer atmosphere without more moisture in it can't necessarily yield more precipitation in a given moment. So by means of this analogy, this is why I've been harping on precipitation and evaporation as two sides of uh, essentially the hydroclimate coin. Uh, because in a warming climate, the atmosphere becomes both thirstier when it's not raining, but also capable of much heavier downpours when conditions are favorable for uh, precipitation to occur. And so this is just a, an image from the paper that we've just submitted, uh, illustrating essentially that this is not just a California thing, but in fact, something we expect to emerge globally over most land areas around the world, that with each degree of warming, the what we're calling here hydroclimate whiplash, these increasingly frequent and high amplitude swings between very wet and very dry conditions and vice versa are likely to increase. And those increases are faster and stronger over land than over oceans. And our best available evidence right now suggests that we should probably expect to see an acceleration, especially over land, in these rapid wet to dry and dry to wet transitions, 
somewhere between about one and three degrees centigrade of global warming. Uh, I actually need to update this slide because we may be even a little bit warmer than this one suggests. But as of 2023, we're now above 1.3 to 1.4 centigrade of global warming. My point there is that we are right in the middle of that range where we should expect to see uh, increasingly rapid increases in global hydroclimate whiplash. So we're living in the middle uh, of this plot right now. So I want to talk more about each side of the spectrum. So I'll start with drought and then move on to floods. Long story short is that in a warming climate, the main reason why droughts are getting worse is not necessarily because of decreases in average precipitation in most regions, and this is specifically true for California as well, but because essentially the same amount of rain and snow just doesn't go as far as it used to because we're seeing more precipitation on fewer days with potentially more intense, but also potentially fewer storms with less snowpack as snow lines increase and as temperatures go up but stronger evaporative demand. That's that increasing thirstiness of the atmosphere, of that larger and expanding atmospheric sponge, if you will. And this is a point that actually NOAA has made many times uh, in the past, which is that you know all droughts uh, used to be hot or cold. You could get a cold drought and it would be dry, but relatively cool. You could get a hot drought. It could be low precipitation and high temperatures. But these days, relative to the historical context, and this is true not only in California, but essentially everywhere else as well, all droughts effectively are now hot droughts. And this is important because it doesn't necessarily change the amount of precipitation that you get during a drought per se, but it definitely changes the amount of evaporation and potential evaporation that you can get, ultimately making droughts dr even drier than they would have been historically for the same precipitation deficit. And you can see this illustrated in these, these plots on the left. This is for the uh, all of the southwestern U.S. states generally over over the past over a century actually so this is a fairly long period of record. The point being, if you look at precipitation on top, there's not much trend in average annual precipitation, and that blue line is pretty flat. But there's a there sure is a strong trend toward increasing temperatures over this period, as you can see in the middle plot, and then also an increasingly prominent trend towards worsening and more frequent drought conditions as you see in that bottom panel there. So what's clear just from this very basic analysis is that it's not really a long-term decline in average precipitation driving worsening droughts in the southwestern U.S. It really is this profound increase in temperature and the increased thirstiness of the atmosphere that goes with it. So I'll zoom through this slide. This is just further illustration by a colleague of the fact that this very effect the aridification of the southwestern U.S. and what's now some some scientists have deemed the mega drought era is now more than 50 percent due to the increase in temperature and increased thirstiness of the atmosphere as opposed to a human caused decrease in precipitation. So essentially this this temperature effect has already tipped us from what would have been a more moderate multi-decadal drought in the Colorado River Basin into what can reasonably be called a mega drought today. And so just to further drive this point home a little bit more locally in California, in the context of wildfires, as temperatures rise, as I mentioned, the gap between how much water can be in the atmosphere and how much is actually present tends to increase. This is actually the definition of that uh, vapor pressure deficit that I mentioned earlier. And because of that, a thirstier atmosphere wants to demand, if you will, uh, increasingly intensive evaporation from the soil and therefore decreasing the amount of water that's available to plants and also decreasing the amount of moisture that's available in dead vegetation. So these might be logs on the forest floor or branches in your backyard or similar things elsewhere. Uh, but all of this plays into this, uh, essentially, this, this broader realization from a number of studies in recent years that it's quite likely that over half of the observed increase in Western United States wildfire forest fire area burn can be directly attributed to these effects alone. And on the right, you can see just how dramatically, since about 1980, that the autumn flammability of vegetation has increased. Uh, this time series ends in 2020. We've had a couple of years that weren't quite so extreme recently, uh, 
But the long-term trend over the past 40 years or so is abundantly clear. And I think I illustrate this because it's quite, I, I think there's growing evidence today that this so-called dry side of the expanding atmospheric sponge is driving uh, wildfire trends that we're seeing, not only in California, but in the Western US and also in many other fire prone and perhaps not so fire prone regions, at least historically, all around the world. And that there may also be an exponential relationship between how dry the vegetation is and the extent and severity of the fires themselves. Uh, and so the long and the short of it is that in California, climate change is strongly contributing to larger and more intense and more destructive wildfires. Uh, this is something that is particularly pronounced in the autumn, but is also true to, 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 to a slightly lesser extent in summer. And part of this uh, may also be due to not only the fact that it's hotter and drier on average than it used to be, but as I mentioned earlier, because that late summer and early autumn period in particular is when we see our offshore wind season. Uh, these are those strong and dry winds that can drive potentially catastrophic fires in Northern and Southern California. They certainly have on multiple occasions in the past decade, but also uh, throughout California's modern history. And what we find is that the overlap between very dry vegetation season and at least the potential for strong winds in autumn to drive those fires is likely to increase in a warming climate. So even if the winds themselves stay about as strong and as frequent as they've ever been, but we just shift this envelope of very dry vegetation conditions. We make them even drier and keep them drier longer into the autumn by delaying that rain, that, that autumn onset of the rainfall, even by just a couple of weeks to a month, as we've already seen in California over the past few decades, that can profoundly shift that overlap period between potentially strong and dry offshore winds in the autumn and extremely dry summer-like vegetation conditions. And this is one of those reasons why autumn is that time of year where we're really focused uh, when it comes to wildfire risk in a warming climate. Because, you know, we've as we've seen with any number of fires in recent years, including uh, the devastating Camp Fire, which just largely destroyed the town of Paradise in November, in, in, in Butte County, which is quite far north in California, where it's usually quite wet by the time November rolls around, it's quite clear why this can be, uh, why this can and should be a major concern moving forward. But to jump to the exact opposite end of the spectrum now and talk about uh, atmospheric river storms and extreme precipitation events. Uh, the very short version of it is, as you'd expect, in a warmer atmosphere with a higher ceiling on how intense precipitation can become that can hold more water vapor per degree of warming, we expect to see a substantial increase in the intensity of wintertime atmospheric river storms. Atmospheric rivers, which you may or may not be familiar with, it's become a more common term on the evening news, the, the weather update, than it used to be. Uh, but just as a refresher, these are the long and narrow corridors of, of water vapor uh, in the lower atmosphere that sometimes attach themselves to winter storm systems and can produce some of California's most extreme rainfall, especially when one of these systems hits the coastal mountains or the western slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains and those strong winds squeeze out a lot of the moisture that's in them. For perspective, some of the larger atmospheric rivers might be uh, carrying a volume of water vapor in the air above your head, equivalent to many times that of the Mississippi River. So these are not uh, subtle features at all. They can really uh, hit quite hard and they carry just a phenomenal volume of water, a considerable fraction of which under the right conditions can fall out uh, over California as precipitation. And so to step back and just look at some historical perspective on this, uh, there is evidence in the paleoclimate record, meaning the record where we derive information about precipitation indirectly through things like tree rings and river sediment deposits and sediment deposits in lakes, that really big flood events occur every one to 200 years over the past several millennia. So over a period much longer than we actually have rain gauges out there to directly measure this, the last really big one occurred in, in 1862, and we haven't seen one as large, uh, even with the recent events we've seen in California, 
uh, since that point. Uh, of course, California was a very different place in the mid-1800s, home to about 400,000 people or so versus closer to, I believe it's getting close to 40 million today. Uh, it's a different universe. On the plus side, we have modern flood control infrastructure. Uh, on the downside, millions of those people live in floodplains that are not protected by California's flood control infrastructure. So the interest in this in a warming climate is that a modern day repeat even without climate change would be pretty disastrous. So what we want to know is whether the likelihood of an event like this is increasing. And a few years ago, we published some uh, study that suggested that there was about a 50-50 chance uh, that an 1862 level event might recur over the next 40 years. That's considerably higher than the risk that you'd expect in a, in a world without climate change. But we wanted to follow up on this, do some additional work, and you may have heard of the arc storm 2.0 scenario and i won't get in too much into the details or methodology but the point is these this was a hypothetical sequence a three to four week long sequence of uh really strong and wet atmospheric river storms that could affect california and we developed essentially two scenarios one that was drawn from what might have been plausible in the 20th century without a lot of global warming and one that might be plausible later in the 21st century with a lot of global warming. These are clearly two very different scenarios. Both could cause big problems, uh, but the future one brings tremendously more water. In fact, some places see in the mountains 80 to 100 inches of rain or more over a three to four week period. Clearly, that would cause some major problems. And you can zoom in, see uh, camp uh, areas close to campus, look at the Santa Cruz Mountains, and there's some yellow and oranges there. That's in the uh, 40 to 50 inch uh, rain, inch of rain range over the course of three to four weeks. So clearly, this would be a very serious statewide flood scenario for California. And we developed this scenario so we could look at the influence of climate change, but also so that we could work with state agencies to better uh, create plans for severe or even catastrophic statewide flooding. So we created this scenario so we could use it as a plausible storyline. Uh, in that context. And so uh, to cut to the chase, climate change, uh, according to our own studies, uh, is definitely increasing the likelihood of an event of this magnitude, as well as lesser floods. In fact, uh, it's likely that climate change has already doubled the, the risk of an event of this magnitude uh, somewhat quietly in the background over the period of time where we've been busy worrying about droughts and wildfires primarily. And for understandable reasons, we've sure seen a lot of them, and they've, they've wrought a lot of harm to California over the past 10 years. But what we find is that the cumulative risk of a major uh, arc historical level event over the next 40 years or so is probably closer to 2 and 3 than 50%. So we find even higher likelihood than in our previous study and what this really means is that we do need to be thinking about the risk of severe floods just as much as we need to be thinking about droughts and wildfires. In some parts of California, the risks of the big floods might actually be even greater. So I can't talk about climate change and precipitation without talking about snow, and it's probably not too much of a surprise that the long predicted uh, and widespread across the western U.S. Uh, snow, uh, snow uh, water equivalent losses are now an observed reality. Uh, these same authors, when they published their paper in 2018, had published a previous paper a little over a decade previous where they didn't find a very strong signal yet, but said, you know, we if we write this paper again in 10 years, I bet, I bet you will see it. And that's in fact exactly what happened and that's exactly what they did, uh, is now this signal is quite widespread. You can see it, all the red circles in the West are places where there's been a statistically significant decrease in snow water in the mountains. There's a few, there's a handful of blue circles suggesting the opposite, but it's quite clear the predominant trend is towards large decreases over this period for reasons that are probably pretty intuitive. Generally speaking, as it gets warmer, you see more rain rather than snow. You see more melting, you see earlier melting and earlier runoff peaks. And more recent research has really pointed to the potential emergence of uh, in, in different basins in the western U.S., particularly some of the lower elevation ones that are more susceptible to just a degree or two of warming, the emergence of very low or even no snow years sooner rather than later. Uh, and we've seen a couple of these in California. We had 13-14 uh, was an almost no snowpack year for much of the California, uh, Sierra Nevada, and, and lower mountain ranges. 
Uh, Pacific Northwest has seen that as well, at least on one occasion in the past decade. Uh, but what's interesting is that the emergence of occasional very low snow years is likely to happen sooner than, than the average decline might suggest. So we're still going to see some individually very big snow years. In fact, we just saw one of them last year in California. In some places, either the greatest or the second greatest snowpack in the entire period of record which falls immediately on the heels of some of the lowest snowpack years on record uh, in the years immediately previous. Which brings me to this final point about snow, which is that even as the average snowpack declines, uh, we should still expect to see uh, individual extreme snowstorms in the mountains and perhaps even some very extreme snow years. Uh, and this is, these, this is data from a different part of the country, but the same argument holds the intuitive reason why snow decreases in a warming climate is it gets warmer and you're on the wrong side of the freezing line for snow versus rain. So the precipitation still occurs, but it's occurring as rain rather than snow at higher and higher elevations. But there is a competing effect, which is that, as I mentioned, that warmer atmosphere, that larger atmospheric sponge can hold more water. So if it is still cold enough for snow, even if it's warmer than it used to be, imagine a place that might have been five degrees below freezing in the 20th century cooler climate, but is now today just a degree or two below freezing, well, that's still cold enough for snow, but now you've got two or three degrees of warming worth of additional moisture in the atmosphere. So there's these competing effects with this thermodynamic effect. You get warmer temperatures, which on its own leads to less snow, but you also have increased moisture, which on its own would lead to more snow. The predominant effect in most places is the temperatures win out. But during extreme snow events and at very high elevations, sometimes that increase in moisture can actually be what's dominating. And so this is sort of what we see. Decreased snowpack overall, more very low or no snow years, but potentially still those really extreme snowstorms and really intense snowfall years, as we have seen the past couple of seasons, probably will continue at least occasionally. So all of this makes for a bit of a grand challenge, and this slide is focused on, on flood risk and infrastructure that isn't perhaps designed for the climate future that we're likely to experience. And this notion that flood control on the one hand, but drought mitigation on the other, that both the, the regulatory and the, the legal uh, and even personal uh, sort of tensions uh, in your own household between uh, thinking about potential flood risk and thinking about being uh, water efficient are sometimes at odds with one another. And this is sort of a theme, I think, that we're likely to see emerge, partly because of this notion of, of the expanding atmospheric sponge, of increasing hydroclimate whish, whiplash, sort of pulling us a bit uh, from both ends. So to uh, I, I do want to end before I uh, we open it up to questions with a few thoughts about what this means for what we should be doing about all of this. And again, to remind everybody, the physical reality is not necessarily that Cal it just stops raining in California, as some have feared. Uh, fortunately, that does not appear to be likely what's going to happen. Instead, we will see more severe droughts and individual dry periods that are probably drier than we've seen before, but we're also going to see very wet periods and an increase in the intensity of individual storms and potential flood risks. So there's a downside to that in that we have to deal with both more droughts and floods, but there's also a potential opportunity there because the water still will be delivered to California. It just won't be delivered quite as conveniently as it has been historically. And so it does mean that we may need to reimagine our water storage and our flood control systems, given this increase in severe droughts, increase in wildfires on the one hand, but also increase in extreme precipitation and flood risk on the other, all the while, while we're losing our snowpack. But it does mean there may be some opportunities for co-managing drought and flood together, and also thinking about wildfire risk in a similar way, whether we can leverage fire to fight fire in a certain sense by using prescribed fire, for example, to mitigate the risks of catastrophic wildfires down the line. And so one thing I think that is really clear is that a lot of the historical paradigms that we've used to conceptualize California climate historically, and also our response to it, uh, aren't going to cut it in the 21st century. And I think we're bumping up against that ceiling right now in many contexts. And that's going to be a continued theme in the coming years and decades as some of these changes
continue to accelerate. And we don't know exactly how far down that warming path we're going to go, except that we do know that over the next two or three decades, there will definitely be additional warming and there will be additional increases in the risks of all the things we've been talking about today. So hopefully by the end of the 21st century, uh, I know that feels like a long time from now, although again, in the climate world, it, it's it's really not that far anymore. Uh, hopefully we will have bent that carbon curve and warming will be slowing and eventually halting. But in the meantime, in the near term, over the next few decades, maybe the decades that matter most to us personally, that we'll all experience personally, uh, this is a period going to be a period of continued change. And we're going to need to adapt as adapt to those changes as well as do our best to mitigate the actual amount of warming that occurs over that same period. And so there are a number of things that we can do. We can ensure that our infrastructure is up up, up to the task. Uh, we don't want things to fail uh, unexpectedly or prematurely during extreme events. Of course, we also need to greatly expand uh, nature-based interventions, things like uh, what I like to call collectively letting the water do its thing uh, within some reasonable parameters. In other words, not trying to corral all rivers into channels and within within concrete constraints, uh, but instead letting rivers meander when they want to meander. And in a major flood scenario, potentially thinking about uh, what places, uh, where would it not be such a bad thing if this place flooded, if it means we can protect Sacramento or some other populated area. Uh, things about strategic aquifer recharge, uh, as I mentioned earlier, using prescribed fire to reduce the risk of catastrophic fires in subsequent years. All of these are opportunities that don't necessarily involve building new large infrastructure, but actually may allow us to take a step back uh, and, and think about how we can use both technology uh, and more passive approaches uh, to sometimes figure out when it when it when it might be the case that fighting really hard might not be the best way to go uh, and to go with the flow might actually be beneficial to all of us if you will so just some closing thoughts and then we'll open it to questions climate change has arrived both in california and elsewhere of course it's no longer a prediction about the future but an observed reality in the present a warmer california is both drier and wetter at all different times due to increasing hydroclimate whiplash courtesy of the expanding atmospheric sponge and all of that means likely more severe droughts and wildfires but also more severe floods and if that sounds scary and doomy and gloomy i think the reason i raise that is the main question is how we can effectively and equitably co-manage those risks uh, because it's not that these are completely unmanageable it's just that we need to be thinking differently about the way the world works and how we're going to interface with it in a warming climate. And California has a great track record of being pretty nimble and innovative when it needs to be. Uh, and, and I would argue this is one of those times where that nimbleness and innovation, it, it is high time to get the ball rolling in a climate adaptation context. A lot of the interventions that are going to be most promising are those that are flexible in both time and space, where they don't corral us in, essentially into a situation where we kind of wish we had done something very differently. Essentially, we want uh, no regrets approaches that make us more resilient to extremes and also, in many cases, just make life better on average the rest of the time when there isn't an extreme flood or a drought or a wildfire around. Uh, and finally, that there is this really big need to integrate climate change, uh, especially extremes, not just mean change, but in particular, these episodic extremes that I've been talking about throughout the presentation into uh, planning and policy, as well as both local and broad scale adaptation uh, as the climate continues to warm. So when I, as I thank everybody, I'll leave this up so you can find me all around the internet. As Noah mentioned, I, I am uh, broadly accessible uh, but with that, I think uh, hopefully I have less than time. We have at least 10 minutes, and um, I I don't have a hard out at the hour, so maybe we can go a little bit past that if others can as well. Uh, but with that, thank you, and I think it's time for questions. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, fantastic. Um, I always learn a lot. Um, so we do have quite a few questions, so I'm going to um, synthesize a couple um and uh so there are three on the on the climate 
um, science aspects. So uh, if you could give your summary of um, how we uh, go about um, differentiating uh, the baseline um, extreme events from um, you know, that, that have always happened uh, from uh, climate change affected extreme weather events. And in that context, there are a couple of questions related to this. One is the role of GCMs and the reliability of GCMs um, given their limitations, as well as um, the this uh, vapor pressure deficit and um, that you talked about, if if you could expand on um, the factors that have influenced the changes in, in the vapor pressure deficit. All right. You kind of covered all of the greatest hits of contemporary climate science uh, there. So these are, I, I, I know these are from several questions, but um, Yes. So really, one of the things that's at the crux, as you know, as I mentioned, of, of, of modern climate science is how do you, how, how do we actually make these determinations about how things are changing relative to how they used to be? And it is actually it's not straightforward at all. You know, there's there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, ultimately, what you need to have in some way is some some baseline, some sometimes we call it a, a counterfactual. So we have both the the climate as it was either in the 20th century or in the millennia preceding it, if we're talking about the paleoclimate world. But then the question is, uh, how certain are we that we actually observed everything that actually happened in the 20th century? One uh, is one question. So how good are our observations? How reliable are they for the extremes that we've observed? One challenge, for example, is if we're talking about uh, a 100-year flood, so a, a flood that would happen on average once in 100 years, or in other words, has a 1% likelihood of happening in any given year, if you have a century of records, you would expect to see, on average, exactly one event. And anybody with a statistical background will know that an N of 1 is it's very difficult to say anything about anything uh, with such a small sample size. So the challenge is we're better able to establish that baseline for events that are less extreme and more common. So a precipitation event that might happen every five years. Well, if you have a 100-year record, you have 20 of those events. So you start to be able to get into the territory of, okay, we can actually look for changes in this because it's happening often enough that there might be a detectable signal. So that's illustrating, one, that the more extreme the event we're talking about, the the, the rarer they are generally, the the shorter the records that we have available to us to distinguish changes in them, and the more uncertainty there's going to be uh, in terms of how large the increases may or may not have been so far. There's a few ways to fill in that gap. Some folks do so statistically, and, and other folks would do so using GCMs or global climate models, which are these tools that represent the, the physics and the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans as we understand them to be. And they do a great job reproducing a global average temperature and a reasonable job reproducing any other key things that we care about, like large scale uh, features in the atmosphere, like ridges and troughs that bring us our weather. And they do a less good job of representing some of the things that are, you know, to be to be fully honest, quite important for extreme events. Uh, we, we can't always fully represent every process we would like to with these global climate models, but they are still very useful tools when used in, in an appropriate context. And importantly, they help us fill in the gaps because, for example, in the 20th century, well, it was the 20th century was by definition 100 years long. So at most, we have 100 years of data from the 20th century. With a climate model, though, we could potentially re reimagine the 20th century many times over. We can replicate uh, dozens of times, uh, and this is actually what's done in what's known as large ensemble modeling, the 20th century. And does it give us a perfect representation of, of the, the atmospheric processes that might have unfolded in the 20th century? Definitely not. But does it give us a much larger sample to draw upon than we might have gotten if we were only limited to those actual 100 years uh, that we have in our in our observations, what it means is that we can actually get dozens of different plausible 20th century like climates, and now all of a sudden our sample size can be a lot greater than one, even for extreme events that occur rarely. So that's one way that we can use 
climate models and, and ensembles of climate models to, to, to help us uh, answer questions about real world events for which our observations might not be enough to tell us what we need to know about how things have changed. And with these models, the other thing that we do is, as I mentioned earlier, it helps to establish a counterfactual. So you can run climate models, for example, including the human emission of greenhouse gases as roughly as it has occurred since the Industrial Revolution in the mid 1800s up through the present. And you can also run those same simulations excluding those human caused increase in greenhouse gases. And in doing so, comparing that counterfactual without that human influence with the version of the model simulations that is intended to closely approximate what we actually put up there in the atmosphere over the past century or so, that difference is what we understand to be the contribution of human caused climate change to whatever changes these models uh, uh, predict in, the, in that difference. So that's uh, a very brief version of climate science in a nutshell. There's so much complexity baked in there. I, you know, I think it is important to realize that, you know, climate scientists are probably the ones who will most profusely tell you about all the failures of climate models. No one in the world is better accustomed with all the ways that things can go wrong and sometimes do. And also, and yet these still are essentially the best tools that we have at our disposal to understand the way the world works, the way the atmosphere works, the way the climate is changing. And overall, in fact, there's literally a paper published today, another late breaking paper, just illustrating that even the dramatic events of the past couple of years, if you look at them from a global average perspective, climate models essentially got it right. Um, so it's not that this is something that's completely unforeseen, but in fact, yes, 2023 was weird in a lot of ways, but even with the spike in warming we've seen recently, climate models largely said, yeah, this is pretty much where we were going to be in the mid 2020s. So they're complicated tools. They're definitely not perfect, as is the case with all models in any scientific context, but they're very useful tools. They've helped us get this far. And so far, from a big picture perspective, they've actually done a very good job predicting how much warming we would see even up to the moment that we're talking about right now in the last few months. I didn't quite get to the VPD. Um, um, well, I think we that, that's that's nicely illustrated in the sponge. Uh, and the, the recording will be archived, so we can uh, go to the go to the uh, replay on that. Um, um, I'm going to put together a few questions about uh, sort of our our preparation, and you um, you highlighted at the end uh, some thoughts about adaptation and including infrastructure. And we have a couple questions about kind of the limits of uh, you know what we're prepared for now, and in particular with the arc storms, uh, but also with how much um, compaction there's been, um, you know, in terms of loss of of aquifer uh, in in our recent droughts, um, as well as our our dams and reservoirs. Um, what's your sense? Because you do talk to a lot of um, a lot of people outside of climate science who are thinking about these issues. What's your sense of of the limits of adaptability, both on the wet side and the dry side, and in particular, as you highlighted, the whiplash? Um, are, you know, are we if we did everything you outlined, are we? You know, what are the odds that we that we get conditions that are that are outside of of what that prepares us for? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's actually a really good question. I think maybe I can find a way to. I'm seeing some of the other questions wrap in an answer that responds to most of what's left. You know, I think that there was there was this fear and there was a potential reality and there was, in fact, an observed reality in some parts of California. I'm, I'm thinking about East Porterville and places like this, that during some of these recent severe droughts that you would actually turn on the tap and no water would come out. That was not the case and it's never been the case for major urban areas in California, but it has been the reality for certain rural and low income communities in California. Uh, but at scale, in terms of the tens of millions of people who live here, the resilience of urban water supplies for the most part in California is quite high. So this is sort of where it really matters what we're talking about. So when it comes to drought, for example, the likelihood that San Francisco or Los Angeles is going to run out of water someday, you turn on the tap and, the and it's gonna be dry is extremely low. 
even in really severe drought uh, scenarios. It's a little bit different in some smaller communities where there's more constrained local water supplies that aren't tied into the state systems. But even there, this is sort of one of the number one things that we try to mitigate against. And there are a lot of pretty effective systems in place to mitigate against it. So that's a drought impact that, you know, even in much more severe droughts, I wouldn't say the risk is zero, but I think we actually have really resilient uh, water supply systems for most of our major urban areas. So that's a, a fear I hear commonly. I don't think it's likely we're going to see a day zero in the same sense that, say, Cape Town, South Africa saw in San Francisco or Los Angeles. So that's maybe some good news. But even in, in drought, there are some things that are going to be much more difficult to, to manage. So with that, you know, with urban water supply, we can reduce, greatly reduce the risk of shortages like that by having big reservoirs, by storing water underground, by recycling water, uh, by by doing any number of things that really make us do more with less and make sure that we have multi-year resilience to droughts. We can't do that uh, out in the forested ecosystems of California. This is not something that, so the the a drought that is historically severe you're still going to get water in San Francisco, but the forests in California are not, there's no water delivery system for the many millions of acres of open land that there is. And so those ecosystems are really going to be challenged by those increasingly severe droughts. Wildfires are really going to respond increasingly. So even within that one kind of hazard, certain impacts, fortunately, are maybe not as, as bad as some folks had feared, but in other ways, it's going to be very difficult to, to mitigate some of those risks. And I think on the flood side of the spectrum, something similar is true where you know, we're actually very well prepared for floods up to a certain point, but beyond a certain point that, that will start to test the limits. And there is an ongoing public conversation about what level of preparedness is appropriate because it's not just a question about floods per se, but it's also a question about values. What are we willing to invest to protect against them? What is a reasonable level of investment? What is a realistic level of physical infrastructure that we would want to see the rest of the time to protect us from the big bad events that could potentially happen. Um, these are all complicated questions. And I think that the answers really depend on the hazard itself, where we are in California, East Porterville, Bush, San Francisco, very different places in terms of vulnerability. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance baked into all of that. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for, for your questions. Um, we're a bit past the top of the hour, so I'm going to turn it over to Janine for our closing. Well, goodness. Um, I've seen a number of comments coming through direct messaging to me about how scary this this all is. And, you know, it, on, in this Earth Month, I guess this is our opportunity to ask ourselves, what's one more thing that we can do to help mitigate the climate crisis? Um, just a wonderful presentation. I want to thank you both so much. And I just want to see if either of you have a final word for our guests. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and um, and it's been great to to get to hear you, uh, your current thoughts, Daniel, and uh, great to be here with so many uh, Stanford alums um, here for this event. Uh, so, Daniel, I don't know if you have any any final thoughts. Yeah, I'll wrap up quickly. Uh, thanks again uh, for the invitation to be here. It's been a, a great a great audience. The questions have been good, uh, and so thank you for all of that. The, I, I would one thing I would close with is that. Uh, because I think a lot of folks often react uh, with a bit of fear and anxiety to the kinds of things that I talk about, the only reason I bring them up is, is not to just scare the pants off of people for no particular reason, just because it feels good to do so. Uh, but instead, it's because none of these outcomes are inevitable, and there is actually a lot that can be done. In many ways, California is one of the places that has the most capacity to do something about all of these things, on both ends of the spectrum, both in terms of being a global leader in mitigating climate change and you know influencing how much warming there eventually is, but also at home in actually reducing the vulnerability and the impacts of the events that we know will affect us. There will be climate extremes, but the extreme events turning into disasters is not an inevitability. And we've seen actually examples of where that didn't happen because of thing of, of uh, policies that changed. I'm reminded just two days ago of, of, of this this huge earthquake in Taiwan uh, 
it was a very large earthquake that affected very densely populated areas. And there, there were unfortunately some deaths, but it's a very low death toll considering how extreme an event it was in a highly populated place. But the that's that was not preordained outcome. That was because there was something bad that happened in the 90s and, and, and building codes were greatly revamped in the meantime. And the outcome this time around was just a universe of difference from the last time. That's a lesson I think that we could learn uh, for any number of climate related hazards, both in California and more broadly. I agree. And we're certainly, um, as much progress as has been made on decarbonization, uh, you know, I've, I've said before, I'll say it again, the, the gap between what's happening and what we're prepared for is getting wider, not, not smaller. So I uh, agree with everything you said. Janine, last word. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate um, your putting time and energy into this for Stanford Alumni for Climate Action, and it's, it's very empowering and motivating. All right. I, I wish everyone a good night. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next month for our next event.